If you're getting ready and excited for the latest M3 iPad Pro, hold your horses before you get swept away by the marketing hype and paid reviews as well, right? Join me in this video here where I'll expose some of the pitfalls that you might miss because trust me, I've been there myself. And hopefully I'll help you decide if the M3 iPad Pro is truly worth it. In this video, I'll share some of the insights based on my experiences with the M1 iPad Pro, the M2 iPad Pro here, and also explore some potentially better options that you might not have considered. The video is structured very simply here. We're gonna look into who truly needs the M3 iPad Pro. Spoiler alert, it might not be me. The alternatives and some tips about specking your iPad Pro to make it a better fit and save you some serious cash as well, and generally how to avoid getting caught up in the marketing hype. I'm Alex and I do down to earth tech videos. Who truly needs the M3 iPad Pro? I wanted to start this video here because I've asked you in my community and it made me realize a couple of things. One, I'm not a pro, at least not as pro as I thought I was. There are so many cool apps and so many cool people out there that are real pros and use the iPad Pros much more efficiently than I can. Not just in the content creation space or engineering, architecture, but many people out there like real artists use it for music production, for example. The other thing that you made me realize in my community was that I'm not alone. Many of you like the iPad Pro just for what it is. You enjoy having that extra power of the iPad Pro, even if you're not gonna push it straight away, and perhaps you're just happy to have all that power, but you still use your iPad Pro mostly for escaping a little bit, right, and just relaxing, watching content, and there's a lot to be said about escapism, right? And talking about escapism, today's sponsor, Exola, is launching a great book about the opportunities in the metaverse. The book by the author, Shurik Agapitov, is called Once Upon Tomorrow, and wow, the first chapter really got me hooked straight away and actually has a lot of parallels as well with what we're seeing in today's world with the Apple Vision Pro, how Mark Zuckerberg, for example, is actually getting the metaverse all wrong. And without giving too much away, one of the key mistakes that the author brings up here is the fact that Mark's version of the metaverse is too centralized and hardware specific, which I really agree and I can see the points there. Are we about to see the same mistake with Apple? Or is Apple actually on the right track with the Vision Pro? The book really got me thinking about that. Lots of great thought provoking chapters as well. And it really opened my eyes to the opportunities as well that will become available in the metaverse. Definitely worth a read. This theme of you know calling for decentralization and a more user centric metaverse was really interesting for me to, because you know I am excited about technology, but I also think it's super important that we don't just become completely disconnected from, from each other, right, as humans. Another very interesting aspect of the book, and this really caught my eye personally because, you know, content creation. In one of the chapters, Shurik really explored this idea of storytelling and microtransactions. I honestly love the idea that is proposed in this book by the different monetization methods and really empowering content creators and, you know, compensating them in the way that is a bit fairer than it is today. And if you like video games, Shurik has a lot of insights into that video game world. And he shares some really fascinating stories in the book that truly opened my eyes to, you know, how things work in the background and how a lot of the technology will power this new world. I personally think there's a lot to be positive about when it comes to the future in tech. And this book, you know, gave me a refreshing view into that, the possibilities in the metaverse. To get your copy today, just follow the link in the description. And if you're watching this from a TV, just scan the QR code here. And thanks so much, Exola, for sponsoring this video. Let's take a look then into some of the options that we're likely to get, how to best spec up your iPad Pro when the time comes, and how you could potentially save a few hundred dollars here. In terms of options, the iPad Pro will have those two different sizes, right? The 11 Pro and the slightly bigger this year, the 13 inch model. You can see some of the expected dimensions here, which are quite impressive from a thickness perspective, especially on that 13 inch version, which is coming into five millimeters. The 11 inch is extremely thin too, a 5.1 millimeters. Got some tools here, we've got the tech. To give you an idea, the current M2 iPad Pro is about 6.3, 6.4 millimeters thick, and that's quite a big change, right? But the size, whilst it's a big change, is not really the big news. The big news is the new display, the OLED display, which is coming to both 11 and 13 inch models. The other thing that is changing is the placement of the camera. I'll save what I really think about that for my, for my review, but I think it's a distraction on any display, to be honest with you. And I'm still sort of ignoring leaks and rumors on this and hoping as a lifelong iPad user that Apple will find a way of housing the sensors and the camera within the bezels. But you know, it's wishful thinking, I know, but I'm hoping still. But once you've settled on the display size that you want, the next thing to choose is storage and memory. And here's where I made the mistake before of you know getting carried away with the marketing stuff and spending way more than I needed to. Both iPad Pros are likely to start with 256 gig uh, in terms of storage and go up to two terabytes. And unless you have a clear need for it, I would steer away from one and two terabyte options. And here's why. There are plenty of reasons to have local storage, right? And there's a lot to be said about that 
convenience aspect, but when the difference is between say $200 and $600, I think most people would rather use that money to you know, buy accessories or indeed an external super fast SSD. I've got one here for example. It's tiny, it's a two terabyte, it goes anywhere, you can hook this up, you can put it on any pocket. There's a lot of pro content creators out there that use this for their much bigger channels than I do and I swear by this thing. The memory options will likely start at eight gig and then go to 16 and perhaps even a 24 gig option for RAM. Going back to what I said at the beginning of the video and shared, you know, what my community thinks, I do think that most people, right, will be more than okay with eight gig RAM. My recommendation here though, is to wait and see what Apple will say about the apps, how potentially iPadOS 18, if there's any nuggets of information that they'll share about the software aspect of it, because, you know, that, that'll make a big difference. You know, if apps and the software will take advantage of the memory, then of course the memory might make a difference. As it stands right now, there's definitely not a lot of use cases out there where memory becomes a big thing on the iPad. This is slightly different if you are a real pro and I'm sharing a couple of examples here on what you can do with 8 gig and 16 gig. If you're generating 8K canvases, for example, on Procreate, and I think that's the highest you can go, 16 gig of RAM will let you have 49 layers open. You know, that's a lot of layers in Procreate. If you use the app, you know that that's, that's quite a decent number. This was based on a test that I did on the M1 iPad Pro and the M2 iPad Pro as well running iPadOS 16, but I just rerun that test again today on iPadOS 17 and it remained the same limits. It lets me create up to 25 layers of 8K on Procreate and that limit goes up to 122 layers if I change it to 4K. So clearly in this scenario, 8 gig of RAM would be more than enough for a lot of people, unless you're generating some huge canvases and you know, th there will be those cases, but for the majority of people, yeah, it's gonna be enough. When I did some 3D modeling to test this, the difference in memory, again, made no difference to the experience of manipulating the models, of working on the models, making changes to them. So for the real pros out there, my recommendation is to really think about the limitations of the software that you're gonna be using the iPad Pro with, because a lot of the apps, even today, won't use all that memory. The caveat here is export times, right? In my tests, the bigger memory, did make a difference when exporting videos, for example, or hundreds of raw images in Lightroom, for example. But again, the difference was fairly negligible. If anything, having a faster Wi-Fi on the M2 iPad Pro in comparison to the M1 iPad Pro made more of a difference actually when using Shaper 3D to import models. The M2 iPad Pro was like 30 seconds faster than the M1 iPad Pro to load a complex design. With all that said, there will be some of you, you know who you are, who will watch this video. And I'll be honest with you, I'm probably one of those people too. And you're gonna think, this is totally logical, this is totally rational, but I'm still gonna max it out. I've been there, you know, sometimes, I respect that, right? There's definitely something around longevity that we can't ignore, but just be careful, don't be too frugal uh, with your money, right? Sometimes it's like, Apple will do this. You know, they will have options in there that you absolutely don't need. Ah, this is that nice time before we get inundated with paid reviews, you know. As a consumer myself, I actually enjoy this period of, you know, just before the iPad is launched because you know, I know that everything that's out there is either rumors and leaks, which I don't pay too much attention to it, or they're genuine, helpful videos trying to kind of guide me through my purchase. You know, the funny thing is, I'm more excited about the new Magic Keyboard than I am about the iPad Pro itself. Apparently, we're getting a new design that will have a kind of a place in here to house the Apple Pencil, which I really appreciate. I think that's a good idea. The Apple Pencil itself, uh, will have a Find Me Enable feature. And I appreciate that because, you know, I've lost my Apple Pencil several times. By the way, if you're enjoying this video, a thumbs up goes a long way. And sharing this video with your friend or someone who loves tech gadgets really helps me get discovered out there. So it may seem insignificant, but it's a huge gesture. It really helps the channel. We're so close to reaching 100K subscribers now, and it would be awesome to hit a milestone with you here. My long-term review of the M2 iPad Pro is coming up too. And I think there's a good case here for a lot of people who may not even need to worry about the iPad Pro at all. Because you know what iPad I use the most? It's actually the M1 iPad Air. And I've been using the Tab S8 Ultra, the Tab S9 Ultra a lot as well. So there'll definitely be some really cool comparisons coming up. But that point I made about the M1 iPad Air is an important one. It took me some time to realize this, but once I realized that most of the tasks that I needed a tablet to perform could be done with a cheaper, lighter, much more, you know, nicer to use iPad Air, it was like a revelation. So I kind of stopped, you know, doing the annoying thing that I was doing two years ago 
wishing that Apple would make the iPad Pro more capable. Kind of gave up on that. I said, right, you know what? You know, it's gonna collect dust anyway. So I just enjoy the iPad for what it is, which for my ears, the iPad Air was more than enough. I did recently try to use the Pro apps on it as well, even Apple's own like Final Cut Pro and Logic Pro. All the apps that I'm showing you here today, but also LumaFusion, uh, DaVinci Resolve, they are cut down versions still with some limitations in all of them. And whilst it's nice to be able to use those apps, for me, they needed a, you know, a more seamless transition between the iPad and the Mac. You know, I would love to, for example, you know, be able to start a project on the Mac here in the studio and then go home, have some dinner with my family or whatever, and later on resume the project on, on the couch using the iPad. Maybe doing some final touches on an edit, you know, with the S Pen, adding the soundtrack, doing, you know, some lightweight editing really, but that's not possible. Final Cut also doesn't allow for external storage edits. You can use external storage with it, but you have to import it into the iPad. If I'm honest, for a small project, you know, that might be okay, and a lot of people will be absolutely fine with that. I can think of a situation, for example, where you might want to do that on a field trip, but then there's a MacBook Air for that as well, right? With no touch screen. Anyway, that's, that's for another video. So as much as I'd love to think that I am a pro and I need the iPad Pro, deep down I know that I just like the gadget too much. You know, I like the latest and greatest. And Apple knows that. Apple will play on that very fact and make me believe that I need an iPad Pro. And I fell for that several times. Personally, I am excited about the M3 iPad Pro, but I am 100% gonna be careful this time with the specs that I choose. Unless Apple comes up with something completely out of the blue here, I wish they did. But yeah, unless that happens, I'll probably be sticking with the base model. My M1 iPad Pro versus M2 iPad Pro review is over here in this video, and I hope to see you there. Now it's over to you, Apple. I hope you don't break my heart again. <laughs>